We are looking today into, again, the relative orientation of the image pair. And it's actually the last lecture where we consider the relative orientation between two images. And so last week we looked into a direct solution for computing the fundamental matrix or the essential matrix, basically using the eight-point algorithm. And um, today we'd like to use this result of the initial guess for the relative orientation um, as an initial guess for an iterative solution. So we're, so we're doing a least square solution for estimating the relative orientation today where we need an initial guess. This initial guess typically comes from the eight-point algorithm and we wanna know, I wanna, wanna now present how we actually use this in a least square setting in order to get a solution which also can exploit the uncertainty in the um, estimation of our points. So if we have different corresponding points and they are measured with um, different uncertainties, for example, we can actually take those uncertainties explicitly into account. Um, so we are all in all in the kind of global setup, we are still in the setting where we have two images and we don't know where those images have been taken. The only thing we know are corresponding points. So there are a couple of points in those images and we assume to know the correspondences between those points. So that this point actually corresponds to this point and that this point over here corresponds to this point and so on and so forth. So we have pairs of points in the individual image. And what we want to do, we want to estimate the essential matrix or what we're going to do today, the basis and the rotation matrix between the two cameras from which we can then directly compute the essential matrix. So the goal is to estimate those quantities over here only based on those corresponding points and assuming we have calibrated uh, cameras. Again, this is kind of from the global perspective, very similar to what we have done last week where we were looking into a, a direct method, so a method that doesn't require an initial guess, where I can directly compute the solution. And what we're going to do today is to um, do a least squares approach, where we have an iterative solution, and where we can use the direct method as the initial guess for doing this. And in the second step, we want to estimate what do we know about our solution. So what is the, how can we analyze the quality of the solution that we are going to obtain? So what can we tell, for example, about the uncertainty associated to the estimates of the parameters for the essential matrix? So there are different parameters involved, typically five degrees of freedom, three for the orientation and two for the base. And um, the question is how certain are we about those parameters that we're going to estimate? So basically doing in more detail three steps today. The first part of the lecture will cover how to compute the, the iterative solution and then we will look into the question, how can we actually evaluate the quality of such a solution? First on a more general level, and then looking into a special case um, of, um, so of so-called Gruber points, where we're in the stereo normal case. Okay, so we start with computing the iterative solution for the relative orientation from corresponding points. So this is kind of the objective for the next, let's say, 30 to 35 minutes. Again, Reminder of what was the relative orientation. So the last time I'm going to repeat that in this course, probably. So we are looking into the essential matrix, which tells me how to, or how points in images are related with respect to each other, in the sense that I can use this essential matrix to formulate the coplanarity constraint. So if I have corresponding points, I multiply one point from the left and one from the right-hand side to this essential matrix, then these the, this equation must be zero if these are corresponding points. And what is involved in computing the um, essential matrix are the orientations of the cameras and the basis which sits in this screw symmetric matrix. Depending on how we actually represent the orientation between our cameras, if we, for example, use a parameterization of dependent images, there are two, the general one and the classical photogrammetric one, we put the first camera in the center of the reference frame. So the first rotation matrix here is the identity. And then the second rotation matrix just tells me how is the second camera look, looking relative to the first one. And the screw symmetric matrix basically tells me in which direction is the second camera sitting uh, relative to the first one, but I don't know at which distance. So this was kind of the way how these five degrees of freedom are distributed over those parameters. So two degrees of freedom go in here and three degrees of freedom go into the rotation matrix. 
And we will use today this parameterization for dependent images. So we have this form and so have to fill this screw symmetric matrix and this rotation matrix with life. And most of the thing that we are doing is actually based on the coplanarity constraint. So we'll use this coplanarity constraint to express our error function, so the function that we aim at minimizing. Because we know that for corresponding points, this equation must hold. We have those corresponding points, given because it's our observations, and so we want to estimate the essential matrix or the five degrees of freedom of the essential matrix in order to satisfy the coplanarity constraints as good as possible. So we start, as last week, out with the coplanarity constraint for our n um, corresponding points. So assume we have n corresponding points, so n point pairs. And so for all of those point pairs, this equation must hold under the assumption that there is no noise in the process and that these are corresponding points in reality, so there are no data association problems. Again, this is typically not the case. We cannot measure those points perfectly, so there will always be noise in the process. And what we are looking for is then minimizing the sum of those uh, of the errors that we have here. And as I said before, we are looking using the parameterization for dependent images. So we can replace this expression with the expression down here. So we have exactly the, the replacement we had before. So this is our matrix E consisting of the screw symmetric matrix of so the basis and the rotation matrix, which tells us how the second camera is oriented um, in terms of its headings or where it's looking to with respect to the first camera. Okay, so clear what we're going to do? I hope so. If not, let me know. Okay, so, and I want to do this today and I don't want to present the general solution here. I want to do this for the stereo normal case or for the approximate stereo normal case. So assume we are approximately in the stereo normal case, so both cameras look into um, the same direction. Um, but of course, they don't exactly look in the same direction and we want to estimate um, the, the relative orientation. But if I use a stereo normal case, this simplifies the math a little bit. So what we are de will be deriving here on the slides is just easier to do this for the stereo normal case and gets a bit more involved, but not um, conceptually more complicated if you do this for the general case. So the, the, the most important thing, we have this coplanarity constraint, and this coplanarity constraint allows us to formulate our error function because we, so we want to minimize the um, sum of all corresponding points of this expression over here. This is a function that we aim at minimizing. Um, and as there is a rotation matrix involved in the process, which depends on the three rotation parameters, there's a nonlinear problem. And so if you want to solve a nonlinear problem with this technique of linearizing and computing uh, the correction for our parameters, then we need to do that in an iterative fashion. So we need to iterate this process, and we typically need uh, a good initial guess. And as we said, we are, we are looking here into the stereo normal case or small deviations from the stereo normal case. We will simply start in this simplified setting with a stereo normal case. But in general, we could use, for example, the eight-point algorithm to compute an initial guess if we don't want to re restrict ourselves to the stereo normal case. Okay, so we make an assumption. This is exactly the assumption I was mentioning. We assume we have approximately the stereo normal case, so that this is a good starting initial configuration for the iterative process. And we also exploit this fact um, during the derivations to simplify one or the other expression. And we will do this in the classical photogrammetric parameterization. Just as a reminder, what was this representation? Okay. So we have our first camera. Oh, I'm not really good in drawing. So where the first camera is looking to, and along the x direction, we have the second camera sitting over here. Not perfectly, not exactly stereo normal case, roughly stereo normal case. And um, so we have one rotation matrix over here. And the second thing is we have the, the, the base vector. And the classical photogrammetric representation was making the assumption that the x component is constant. So the uh, x was constant. And then that means we typically, if we have small deviations from the stereo normal case, we have small deviations in. Um, 
Vy and Vz. So they are, they are probably small, and this is probably not too far away from the identity matrix. OK? OK, so in terms of problem definition, we want to estimate the, the basis and the rotation matrix. We are approximately in the stereo normal case. Uh, we have observed image coordinates. Just kind of for simplifying the notation, I just dropped the, the superscript k over here. So everything what we do here happens um, in the calibrated images. So although I just will write x prime, y prime, it means that we have those, um, assuming we have a calibrated camera for this lecture today. The second thing is we assume to know the uncertainties with which I can measure my corresponding points. And we make a typical assumption that we can measure them in both images with the same quality. So it's not that in the left image I can measure them uh, better or more precisely than in the second image. We can do this in the same way. And that they are uh, not, not correlated. So this basically means we can estimate the, the point locations with some uncertainty, which is the same for all points, multiplied with an um, identity matrix. So that means we just have a diagonal matrix where the uncertainty with which I can measure the x and y location of every point on the main diagonal. So those points are independent of each other, if I make this assumption over here, and the assumptions I can all measure them with the same quality. But of course, I could also change that. So if I can measure, let's say, the x location more precisely than the y location, I would, in the, di in the diagonal matrix, with the same values in there, then would have alternating values on the main diagonal. Or if I have some points which I can measure more accurately, then I would have to place um, different variances on the diagonal of the covariance matrix. OK? But the important thing is here that they're independent of each other. The second thing, we need an initial guess. So this is all the elements which have a superscript A. This is kind of an approximation. This is our initial guess, A for approximation. And so, as we said, we are approximately in the stereo normal case. That was the assumption that we are doing. We simply take as our initial values um, Bx is our constant, 0, 0 for By and Bz, and that our initial rotation matrix is the identity matrix. If we would not make this assumption, we would have to execute the eight-point algorithm, for example, here to obtain an initial guess. OK? Everything clear so far in the setting what we're going to do? Any questions? OK. So the next thing that we have to do, we have to look into our, um, our error function, our observation equation, which was a coplanarity constraint, and check how we can actually linearize that. So we start with this form that we have over here. This is our initial guess. So we will start from our initial guess. And then we can say, so my camera, uh, the, the, um, the observed point, is the observed point according, given that my initial, my initial uh, point, plus some small changes in the coordinates. And so I know if I'm the camera coordinate frame, this is my measured point in x, in y, and I have the camera constant here because this describes the plane in the camera coordinate frame. So the, the distance from the origin is exactly the camera constant because there's a distance from the image plane to the projection center. And if I make small corrections to my corresponding points, this is a small change in x and a small change in y, but there's no change in c because kind of the, the pixel can't jump out of the image plane. So this constrains the pixel to the image plane. So I just have small changes in x and in y. And I do the same thing also for the second camera image. So for the second camera image, we have our observed coordinates, our camera constant here, and I allow for small corrections in the second coordinate. OK? So the next thing we need to look into is the uh, screw symmetric matrix and the rotation matrix. So in terms of the screw symmetric matrix, so that our basis, our initial guess for the basis, plus some small changes. And how can these small changes look like? So the initial guess has 0 and 0 in the deviation in uh, y and z. And we have our constant in bx. And this equation now strongly depends on this classical photogrammetric 
representation of dependent images in the sense that we say that bx is a constant. And therefore, we have a zero sitting over here. So the only change that we do is deviations in the y direction and deviations in the z direction. If I would use kind of the general parameterization now, I would have also here a change in x and then an additional constraint that the, the norm over this vector of the resulting vector must be 1. But in this case, it's kind of simpler to do that in this form because we can say bx is constant and then simply this value is 0. Which means that I basically have only that I have two unknowns over here, and these are my two additional unknowns that I want to estimate. So what's the deviation? from this vector in the y direction and in the z direction because I know the, the x direction has a constant length. This was the assumption that this parameterization actually made over here. So this also makes intuitively sense that for the basis we have two degrees of freedom, so two variations in, our, in my unknowns because these, these are exactly the degrees of freedom that I have in that process for estimating the basis because the three additional ones go into the rotation matrix. <clears throat> so just take this vector over here and say it has this form and put it to the screw, screw symmetric matrix. I can express this as a screw symmetric matrix um, of my initial guess plus the screw symmetric matrix which encodes the small differences, so this deviation from the, um, <clears throat> from the initial guess. So this was a screw symmetric matrix of the initial guess and this is the correction in the screw symmetric matrix just by putting in the definition of the screw symmetric matrix. So my resulting final screw symmetric matrix can be expressed in this form. Initial guess plus the correction that we're doing. So far so good. Any questions about this? Okay. We have this simple form that dependency on bx here of bz and by and no dependency on bx here only because of this classical photogrammetric representation. Okay. Then we have to look into the uh, rotation, and the rotation is the part where we have our nonlinearities because we have the rotation matrix, um, which is a nonlinear function. We said here our rotation matrix is again a sum of a rotation matrix of the initial guess plus some small increments. This was the um, identity matrix, so the identity matrix over here, plus a small update in the rotation. And this is kind of the linearized form of the rotation, how the three rotation angles are updated for small rotations. Again, this makes the assumption that we have our, the, the identity is our initial guess and we have small deviations from the identity. And this has three unknowns. These are my three corrections in my unknowns. The three guys over here. I can now use this to actually formulate the coplanarity constraint, everything we did, by saying I have the parameter in as the, the observations in X. I have my screw symmetric matrix in BX, BY, BZ, assuming that BZ and BY are only small increments. And I have my rotation matrix over here, assuming that I have only small deviations from the identity matrix, multiplied with the um, second, the, the coordinates of the image, the, se in the, the coordinates of the point in the second image, and this has to be zero. This was my coplanarity constraint for, uh, for the approximate stereo normal case, so approximately stereo normal. Now I can use all the delta increments to compute the linearized form of this equation. So this was my original coplanarity constraint. I can now write down the linearized form of that. So what I have is I have the coplanarity constraint for my initial guess. So all quantities have the A for initial guess over here. And then I have the four other terms where I have the, the, the small increments taken into account in the first image coordinate, so dx prime over here, dx double prime over here, and the second one. The rest is basically copy-paste from the first line. 
the change in the baseline and the change in the rotation matrix sitting over here. Okay? Just taking our original nonlinear function and turning it into this linear form over here. And so, especially the dr, the function dr now does not depend on sine and cosine anymore. So it's nonlinear because it's a linearized form. Okay? Okay, now we just take this equation and expand it all the individual expression. This kind of now blows up to a very large equation. It looks like something like this, but it's not at all complicated. It's just a direct replace of what we had before. So let's start with the first line. So this line over here. This corresponds to this first line. So we have x, y, and the camera constant here. So this was the original, original measured corresponding point in the first image and in the second image correspondingly here. And for the initial guess, we had our screw symmetric matrix, which has no deviation in y and no deviation in z, only bx. So this screw symmetric matrix only contains bx, nothing else. And our rotation matrix was the identity matrix, the initial guess. So this guy here was the identity matrix, so the identity matrix can be omitted over here. So this first line represents to this line over here. The second line is basically a copy base from the first line except that we now take the small deviations in x into account here and this is exactly this equation over here. So we, here we have the corrections in the x and y coordinate of the first point. So this was the normal case. This was the change in x. Here we have the change in x double prime. The rest stays the same. Change in the double prime. Here we have the change in the screw symmetric, matri screw symmetric matrix. This expression over here. Again, this all are identity matrices, therefore they are omitted over here. So this is a change in SB. And finally, we have the change in the rotation matrix, which goes in here. So this is the only line. We have these two, two matrices in here. So this is the change in R. What we've done, we've just expanded this equation with its definition. And what I now have to do is, or what I will do, we have to actually compute all those expressions over here. So I can start with that, <coughs> saying we have x prime y prime c multiplied with 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, minus bx, 0, bx, 0, x double prime, y double prime, c. So this is the first line that we have over here. Well, the first thing we can do is say, OK, we multiply this with this expression over here. So this vector stays the same, x prime x double prime c. So this is a zero vector, so we'll have zero over here. This vector multiplied with this vector gives me only the last component minus bx times c, and here only bx times um, bx y double prime remains. And if I multiply those two matrices, I obtain the form minus bx times c times y double prime plus bx times c um, okay, so I must have made a mistake here, exactly, this is prime, not double prime so this is prime over here So I can rewrite this in the form. This is bxc of y double prime minus y prime. OK? So the first expression over here, the first line, this line over here, simplifies 
to this expression. What I now will do, I will do exactly the same steps with the second line, third line, fourth line, and fifth line. And just simplify them to these types of expressions. Okay? If I do this, I actually end up in this simpler form. So we see the first line over here. It's exactly what I had written here on the blackboard. And I get similar expressions for the other. For the second line, it's easy to see. The only thing we changed, um, the only thing which changes here is the change in, um, in dy. And if I combine this with the next expression, that are groups, those which depend only on the differences in y, I can build up these equations. OK, so if I have this form, this simplified form, this e expression in the bracket is actually the parallax in y. The second line is actually the correction of the parallax in y. This guy's over here is a parallax in x, so I can express this as the x parallax px. Here, I can't do the simplification that easily. The only thing that I can do is I say, OK, assume that I'm in the stereo normal case, or approximately the stereo normal case. I know that the parallax here should actually be 0, because this was the constraint of the stereo normal case. So x prime and x double prime, uh, y prime, sorry, y prime and y double prime should be approximately 0. It's the same, not 0, sorry, the same. And if I replace this by y prime, so this is an approximation, which holds in the perfect case of the stereo normal case, then those two elements depend only on y prime, and this gets the um, x parallax. So I can then simplify the expression over here, just Take what I had before, replacing y double prime minus y prime by the parallax in y, the change in the parallax in y, parallax in x, parallax in x, and here is the y prime coordinate still involved. And these are the components from the rotation matrix. <coughs> so what I now have, I have my linearized observation equation, and if I especially look into the first two elements over here, they both depend on the y parallax and the change in the y parallax. And all the others do not depend on that. All the other equations here depend on my unknown parameters. So B, the change in by is an unknown parameter. The change in bz is an unknown parameter. Um, and the changes in the angles. I have in here. So this kind of one, two, and three. So now can, what I can actually do is I can, in this equation, move these two blocks on the other side and divide by c times bx. So I divide this expression by c times bx and move these two elements to the other side. And then this equation will actually have a simplified form, and you may recognize this form again. So what I have in here is PY plus DPY, just by moving those two elements on the other side and dividing by C times, C times BX, the whole expression. And so what you have actually in here are our observation in the Gauss-Markov model for that. So this is the, the parallax and Y, what I'm looking into, so how much do the corresponding points deviate in y, because this is the error or the observation from the coplanarity constraint, it should be zero. Then I have the changes, the, so the corrections, sorry, the corrections in the observations. And this should be equal to some equation which depends on my unknown parameters, my five unknown parameters, one, two, three, four, and five, 
and some coefficients over here. So this is one of the coefficient, this is a coefficient, this is a coefficient, this one, as well as this one. So what I can now do, I can say, okay, I'm, I'm happy with this part of the equation. Actually, I'm now splitting this up into two vectors, one vector consisting only of my unknowns, and a second five-dimensional vector consisting only of the coefficients. So this is copy-paste from what we have on the previous slide. So this gives me my coefficient vector, and this is my vector of the unknowns. Oops. So what I in the end have, I have my vector of unknowns, or corrections of the unknowns. I have my coefficient vector, and I have my observation and my correction to the observation. So what I basically have is the basic equation for the um, Gauss-Markov model. This was just done for one equation, so for one coplanarity constraint, so for one pair of corresponding points. Now I can simply do this for all pairs of corresponding points. So basically, from having this simplified form, so this is uh, the parallax and the change, the correction of the parallax, um, towards this form, I can actually write this as these are my parallaxes, these are my corrections to, to my parallaxes, this is my matrix A, and this is the change in the, or the corrections in the parameters. And so, given this, we have the standard uh, Gauss Markov model and can actually solve this system of linear equations. A few words in terms of uncertainties. What are the uncertainties in the y parallax? The uncertainty in the y parallax depends on the uncertainty how accurately I can measure the y coordinate of the individual points. This, since this involves the computation of two points, I have this expression, so the variance of the y parallax is the sum of the variances of the of measuring the first point and the second point, and assuming that I can measure both um, equally well, this is the standard deviation, so I on, it only depends on one coordinate. And assuming that there's no correlation between the points, what we explored before, then my covariance matrix about the observation is just a diagonal matrix which has um, this, uh, this expression, so the squared on its main diagonal. So it's a the important thing is, so this is an n by n diagonal matrix because we have n, have n observations over here. Okay? So we then put everything together, my system of normal equations. Um, we have this form, move this to the other side and then obtain for the parameter corrections this expression over here just consisting of my uh, matrix A or the Jacob, which is also known as the Jacobian, I have the matrix encoding, or the weight matrix, or the matrix encoding the uncertainties in the observations, and my corresponding delta L. And I can also turn this into the, um, the same, obtain the corrections for the observations, and compute those expression, um, take, taking into account the matrix A, the parallaxes, and the, uh, the parameters that I'm going to have. So the important thing is I have this a form how I derived it here only for the first iteration. Because in the first iteration, the stereo normal case was the initial guess. And we actually exploited this in our computations to simplify these matrix expressions. In the second iteration, the initial guess, so the initial guess for the second iteration, as a result of the first iteration, is now not the stereo normal case anymore. So I would need to relinearize um, and then have a different linearization point. It gets slightly more complicated to the derivations, but there's nothing which is conceptually different in here. So basically, have my solution and iterate this process until convergence. And if I do this, I obtain the, uh, the corresponding corrections for my parameters and for my observations. So in the end, I can estimate the relative orientation through the corrections of the parameters by iterating this process. 
So in the end, represented here in the last 35 minutes is an iterative approach for estimating the relative orientation using the standard least squares approach. We did that four calibrated cameras, four known corresponding points, assuming that we are not too far away from the stereo normal case. We used this to, for, the, for the linearization to simplify the expressions that we used in here. So this was the basic approach on how to compute the relative orientations of the parameters of the essential matrix in an iterative way for the stereo normal case, but um, it's not dramatically more complicated in the general case. Are there up to this point any questions about this process over here? Okay, if this is not the case, we'll make a five minute break and then we're going to continue. Thank you. Okay, so in the second part today, we want to look into what is actually the quality of our result or how good is our solution. We'll first do this a slightly more general discussion and then um, do this concretely for the problem that we have been investigated here with a special setup of points in the environment. The question, how do I actually describe the quality of my result? There's, there are several terms which are relevant in here. The, the key ones is actually precision, trueness, and accuracy. So what is meant with precision or in German Präzision? It's the, it's the question, how close is the agreement of the, um, of the measurements, of the independent measurements that I have among each other? So for example, if I, so kind of what is the spread of the data points or of my independent measurements that I have? Not knowing what the true value is. In contrast to this, the trueness describes how far is the mean of several executed data points away from the true value. So what's the, so kind of I, I take my samples, I compute their mean and estimate how far is this mean away from the true value. So this requires me to know the true value, but it doesn't tell me anything about how far the points actually spread out. And the accuracy kind of combines the precision and trueness and takes this into it. Takes also the, the, the true value into account as well as the spread. So we can illustrate this with a quite nice plot. So down here, so the true value is here in the center. And I move along this axis over here. This is the precision axis. So if I have a low precision, these points are actually sp spread out in space. I'm not along this dimension not interested how they are located with respect to the true value, just look to the spread of these points. So here they have a large spread, here's those points, they have a smaller spread. So this is increasing precision. So if I repeat my experiment, I get more similar values. In contrast to this, if I move along this dimension, I increase trueness in the sense that if I compute the mean of these data points, I'm somewhere over here, so I'm quite far away from the true value, which sits over here. In contrast to this, here the points still have a large spread, but this is not what I'm interested in, what I'm <coughs> describing through the dimension of trueness. But here the mean of these points will be probably lying somewhere over here, so it's much closer to the true value compared to this example over here. And if I kind of combine the two things, that's actually what I have. I have my increasing accuracy. So I'm reducing the spread of the points and I'm reducing the deviation um, of the mean of those data points from the true value. So the more I go up here, the better, the better my result is. I also made one slide with the different translations of those terms between uh, German and English. So precision and precision, or sometimes also called innere Genauigkeit or Wiederholgenauigkeit. Trueness is uh, Richtigkeit, accuracy is the äußere Genau Genauigkeit im Deutschen, and um, we also have the term of reliability or um, zu Zuverlässigkeit. So in German text, you sometimes have to be careful if people only talk about Genauigkeit. If this is, you mean innere or äußere Genauigkeit. In English, 
this is defined through the terms of accuracy and precision. Also, you have to be careful if you take a standard dictionary, they will, they will probably don't distinguish between precision and accuracy, but it's distinguished in terms of, te of a technical term. But if you look to a standard dictionary, um, those values, uh, those two words, precision and accuracy, are typically not distinguished, but they are in technical terms. So let's get a bit more concrete and let's look what we want to look into for our relative orientation. We want to analyze the precision because we don't have the true value. So we look into the precision and the, or the question is how large is the influence of noise on our result? And then we want to look into the reliability in the sense, do we have a chance to detect outliers? So if we analyze our solution and is there a chance for us that we are able to detect outliers in our corresponding points? So two points which have been labeled as corresponding points, but which are in, the, in reality non, not corresponding points. Okay, in terms of the precision that we want to analyze, um, we actually need the covariance matrix of our unknowns because the unknowns are the parameters of the relative orientation and I'm interested in the uh, spread of those values. And there are two terms, the one of the theoretical precision and the second one is the empirical precision. The theoretical precision I get directly um, from my model taking into account my Jacobian um, and the inverse of the covariance matrix of the um, uh, uncertainties of the observations. So the kind of the information matrix of my observations um, in this form and this gives me the theoretical precision. In addition to the theoretical precision, there exists the empirical precision and they're related via a factor and this is it's called the variance factor. It's kind of this guy sitting over here. And in the perfect world, this variance factor is one and my empirical precision is my theoretical precision. But in reality, I often have values where this term deviates from one and this is typically due to the fact that my model doesn't perfectly match what happens in the real world. Or the uncertainties that I assumed on how accurately I can actually locate a point in my image was actually wrong. So I made wrong assumptions about the world and this is often shown through this different variance factor. So what does the variance factor look like? The variance factor is given by this um, expression over here. It consists of this term omega which is the weighted uh, sum of the three corrections of the parallaxes that I have. So my corrections in my observations, taking into account the uncertainty of the observations and the redundancy. And the redundancy is simply the number of corresponding points that I have minus the unknowns that I have. So if the number of unknowns uh, equals the number um, uh, the, the number of corresponding points that I have, I can typically obtain a unique solution for my, um, for my problem because I have the same number of unknowns than equations, but what I typically have, um, if R is larger than one, then I need my least squares approach to find the solution which minimizes the, the overall error. So this way I can actually compute my um, variance factor and I can, can also use this to actually tune the uh, matrix which tells me well, this matrix over here, this is just because I'm in diagonal form, um, this matrix over here to estimate how accurately can I actually localize a point in an image assuming that all other assumptions that I made are actually correct. So and once I then have this matrix for the um, estimator of the empirical precision given by the variance factor just expanded with the term on the side and the theoretical precision over here I can then look to the individual elements along the diagonal of this um, of this matrix and so this is a five by five matrix which then tells me something about the uncertainty associated to my estimate the deviation of the basis in Y, in Z is the second dimension, and third to fifth dimension refers to the um, parameters of the rotation. 
So if I compute this expression over here, I have an empirical estimate of the precision of the individual values that I have. It requires me to invert this expression over here. So for a large system, this can be computationally um, complex, so computationally expensive. But as is a five by uh, five by five matrix, this is not the problem um, over here. Okay. The next thing I may want to look into is the correlation of the parameters that I have in here. So if I assume that they are independent, but in reality there's a strong correlation between those parameters, this can lead to numerically instable situations. Or if I have a correlation towards 100% of two variables, which I assume that they are independent of each other, um, this will always result in uh, least square in the least squares abroad, actually failing to invert the matrix. And if these values which are close to one, but I assume them to be independent, then I can run into um, numerically, uh, numerical instabilities of my solution. So this can be used as a check to see if I have parameters which are strongly correlated, although I assume them to be independent of each other. The next thing I want to look into is the reliability. And so this was the question. Um, how well does my setup allow me to estimate um, if a point is an outlier or not? And so I'm taking into account the covariance matrix of my corrections and see if I have a correction which is much larger than the variance that I'm expecting this correction to be. So I have one, correction which, one observation which requires a very, very, very large correction, much larger then the um, covariance matrix here associated to it, or the variance associated to it, is a good indicator that this is um, an outlier. But the question is, or what the redundancy components that we will, do, will, will see now actually allow me to do is to estimate how large is the, um, how well do the, is a change in the components, or there's a direct relation between how well I can s estimate if, an, if a data point is an outlier because it tells me the, the impact that it has on the corrections. So the redundancy components are defined as the variance of uh, my Vn. So these are the, uh, of the, of the corrections and divided through the observations. So this term um, is always smaller than this term or equal. You can see this in this expression. Um, so as I'm subtracting this value over here, this guy is always smaller than this guy. If I break this down, this gives me then values between 0 and 1. So I have redundancy components for the individual corresponding points, which take values between 0 and 1. And if I sum all of them up, I actually obtain my redundancy value. So this tells me actually what is the, um, how I actually can split up the, the overall redundancy on my individual observations. OK, so what the redundancy components actually tell me is the fraction of the original error we see in the residual of the parallaxes. So the Vn were the corrections of our parallaxes um, after the adjustment. So I have this direct relation over here. Um, and so, for example, if I have for a value redundancy, a very small redundancy component, so small means something close to 0, let's say. 0, 0, 5. And um, I have an error in terms of 40 pixels over here. So this is an error of, let's say, 40 pixels and a, a very small redundancy component. This will lead to a correction or an adjustment, which is very small. In this case, would be 40 pixels times 0, 0, 5, so 2 pixels. So if I have a small redundancy component, I don't see an effect of this outlier, how strong the outlier um, affects the corrections. On the other hand, if I have a large redundancy component, so a value which is close to 1, then an error in the observation will lead to a very, very large correction in my parallaxes, which is an indicator that something went wrong if I relate this then to the expected uncertainty that I have. So it tells me kind of. How, how large is the effect 
of, an, of the observation that is visible in the change in parallaxes. So if the values are large, I actually have a chance to observe that. If this is small, um, there's no chance for me to observe that here. You can go a bit more concrete and now look to our um, to the solution that we computed before, the relative orientation for the stereonormal case, and analyze the result of that. And one typically does this um, based on something which are called um, Gruber points. So <coughs> um, Otto von Gruber um, did this work in the 1930s for, he worked on aerial photography, and so you have two images over here, they have an overlap, in this case of approximately 60%, and um, we have six points, so those points all, they're just, so they basically sit here at the border of the images, just drawn a little bit to the inside in order to, for better visibility. So I have here, the, they have the distance B, the, the base and in the image, and kind of the distance is half the size of the image that I have. And so these are kind of the overlap of those images, and these are the observations that I would get in those images. The question is based on these points, how accurately can I actually estimate the relative orientation of, um, in the stereo normal case, given this approach. So of these six Gruber points, I assume identical uns uh, uncertainties in the Y parallaxis, so I can estimate the difference in the Y coordinate in the left and the right image in, with, the, with the same accuracy. And the basis in the real world is basically given by the image scale and the basis in the image. So this is kind of the basis in the image that I have, assuming I'm in the stereo normal case. Um, and so this basis in the image for the standard aerial photography analog films, 33 by 33 centimeters, would result in 9.2 centimeters because 9.2 is 40% of the size of the image is what I moved in order to get a 60% overlap. So I kind of move 40% of the image size in order to get a 60% overlap. So my VX is 9.2 centimeters over here, which gives me the overlap of 60%, and I have these six points. The first thing I now do is I have to determine the coordinate coordinates of these points. So this can be done actually quite simple. So I have my first image and my second image. So this is the center of the coordinate frame of the first image and this one of the second image. So the first point, this point over here, will have the coordinate 0, 0 in the first image and minus b, 0 in the second image. Okay. And then you can do this for the third, fourth, fifth, and so on. And the only parameters that obtain are the B and the D in there. So what I now can do is I can take the um, coefficient matrix that I had from my system of linear equations, and those values de were actually dependent on some of those parameters over here. So I can actually add those values into this e e equation. If I do this, so I have this equation. This expression for every line, so for the first corresponding point, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth point. I put those values in here, and this gives me my coefficient matrix. So, for example, um, for the first point, y prime was zero, y prime was zero, and therefore this element actually cancels out. For the Third expression, only the, this, this, the, the term C survived. This is because this element actually turned out to be zero, and so on and so forth. So I get for every of, of my points, I actually get those. In, no, sorry, that was wrong. This C resulted from the second point. The third element is this element, yes. So I get this coefficient matrix for the individual points just by putting in the coordinates and estimating those individual values. And I need this in order to estimate the um, individual quantities like the theoretical precision. So I can build my matrix of normal equations by taking this matrix, transposing it, and multiplying it with this matrix. So I actually obtain this, this result over here, which directly leads me to the theoretical precision because I was assuming an uncertainty of the individual points, which was equal to 1. Otherwise, I would have the inverted um, covariance matrix 
uh, sigma LL in here. So, which then basically, if I do this computation, I exactly have this form, so I have my covariance factor. I have A transpose A inverted, so this matrix is exactly the matrix I had in the previous slide, so if I go back, this matrix inverted, which gives me this matrix, so I end up having the theoretic, or the empirical, pro sorry, empirical precision of my, uh, of my parameters. So this matrix now tells me something about the empirical precision. So what I can do is, I can actually look into those values over here, because these are those values which allow me to estimate the uncertainties in the, in the individual parameters that I have. So I take there and cut out the block and take the square root and then of those elements over here. So I obtain the um, uh, standard deviations for my five parameters. So given the Gruber points that I have, this will be the uncertainties that are associated to the individual parameters that I compute for the relative orientation. We now can have a look actually what it means to have those parameters over here. So one of the things that we see is that all those components depend linearly on the standard deviation in uh, sigma y, prime or double prime, we assume to be, to be the same. That means depending on how accurately I can measure my pixel coordinates or the coordinates of the corresponding points, the better those estimates will be, which makes intuitively sense. So if I can measure my points more accurately, I assume to get a better relative orientation. Right? We can see here that there's a linear dependency in the standard deviations. And there are, so there's kind of some other things. So all quantities are proportional in the, how accurately I can actually measure the parallax, which is directly related to, on how accurately I can measure the individual, the y coordinates of the points. So the, the baseline, so the direction of the two cameras are directly related to the image scale number. So if I increase the size of the scene, then I would actually get, um, increase the uncertainty. Therefore, those elements depend on B. So if I don't change the image, just change what I'm observing, the uncertainty in those values actually increases. Then I have kind of the D, this was kind of the, 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 the direction of the images in here, exactly this was D. So the D has direct influence on how accurately I can actually estimate the roll and the pitch. So it makes sense if I just have kind of one line of corresponding points, I can actually measure those angles, so the roll and the pitch angle, which is roll and pitch. Um, so it has direct influence how accurately I can actually measure them. <coughs> and the larger the overlap is of the images, so the larger B is, the B sitting down here, the better the, my estimates typically get. So the larger my overlap is in the images, um, the actually the better my, the results that I obtain. So these are kind of the important elements in order to knowing which of the parameters influence in which way the precision of my parameters. So depending on the setup of the points that I have, I can estimate certain parameters more accurately or less accurately. Okay, the next thing we want to look into is the reliability. Reliability was taking into account the redundancy components, and in order to obtain the redundancy components, I need to look in this covariance matrix and um, as we assumed the, um, the standard deviation to be one, I just basically divide through one and I can just take those elements on the main diagonal. So if I take those values on the main diagonal of, these, of the group of points, I actually see that for two of those points, this, and these are the, for the points one and two, I actually get redundancy components of approximately a third, and for all the others, redundancy components of approximately one twelfth. But all redundancy components are rather small. They're not very large. But they're all closer to zero than to one. 
especially those guys over here, R3 to R6. Those are slightly better. So what it means if I have redundancy components which are all very sm small is that gross errors in the Y parallaxes must be really large so that I can detect them based on the correction that I'm computing. Because oh, there's a factor of 1 divided by, tw by 12 in this process, or 1 divided by 3. So it's, it's, it's hard for me in this setup to find gross errors. So the important message is, given this relation, these values are very small. Gross errors and large errors in here will not generate large corrections where I can actually see them. It would be better if those values would be large because then I have a chance to actually identify outliers. But this is not the case in here. What I can do in order to improve the situations is not take the standard six grouper points, but take more points into account. So what I can do is I can take uh, grouper doppelpunkte or double points, where so instead of six points over here, I duplicate points. I measure actually two points in this location. So six points, which are at the, but at, at the in those locations as well. So basically I have two points which I can measure instead of one point. I'm duplicating those points. I can do exactly the same computations again. So if you now the, see these two matrices over here, um, so this is those computed for 12 points and those computed for um, six points, we can actually see that the elements on the diagonals are larger, so actually you can see this factor over there. So the, the elements on the diagonals are larger and it, and it turns out that we have redundancy components of two-thirds for the first two Gruber uh, doppelpunkte or double points and seven twelfths for the other points, which is much better because those redundancy components are larger. That means especially if I have outliers in those points, I can actually see them very well. And even here, those values are actually larger than 0.5. So, so the um, narrow on the observations of, let's say, 100 pixels maps to an update of a bit more than 50 pixels in the corrections. And if I kind of re can relate those corrections with the uncertainty associated to those corrections, I can actually make a test if this is an outlier, yes or no. But this only works if there is this map, if, there, if those points are actually visible and this is expressed by the redundancy components. So in this case, the outliers much, are much easier to detect with this group of double points because the individual redundancy components are larger. And the result for this is just because I used more points in my images in order to um, set up my system of linear equations. So I had more points contributing to my H matrix, to my A, A matrix, sorry, no, H matrix. And since A transposed A inverted gives me the uncertainties, which then have an influence on how the redundancy components are computed, I have more information in there, which allows me to better estimate if a point is an outlier or not. So the key message is the more points we have, the easier we can actually take those outliers, because the redundancy components here get larger. Okay, um, in terms of what have we learned in terms of the analysis of the, of the precision or the quality of our solution, especially look into the precision. So we, we identified based on the theoretical precision and the variance factor what the precision of the individual parameters are. And the, individual, the precision of the individual parameters depends on certain properties in my image, like how accurately can I measure the y-coordinates of my pixels? So y-coordinates because we're in the stereo normal case and this is the parallax that matters in the y-direction. Also that the base depends on the image scale in a linear way. Then we have dependencies of these d and b, so the, the overlap that we have um, in the image and the coordinates in the, other, in the direction orthogonal to that. Has an, Different influence on the different parameters, your pitch and roll, and the two parameters for the baseline. And we have also seen that um, in order to detect outliers, 
we want to have large redundancy components. And if I have a small number of points, like with these six Gruber points, the redundancy components are small, so more towards zero. And this means it's hard for us to detect those outliers. If those redundancy components are larger, which we can obtain by, for example, user using the Gruber double points, so using more points in the environment, we, in we increase the values of those redundancy components and then have a better chance to estimate, to detect outliers, because we know that an error in the observation directly maps into the corrections of those observations. This is the only way for me where I can actually see those large errors if I relate them to the uncertainty that the, uh, to the yes, uncertainty that they are supposed to have. Again, this is also you find the more information on that in, in Wolfgang's script or in the book, um, or most of the things I have told you you should have probably seen also in uh, Professor Schuh's lecture on Statistik und Ausgleichungsrechnung. Um, so what's the theoretical precision, empirical precision you should have, should have seen there as well. Um, I'm not sure, has he done the things with the redundancy components as well? Or what was the first time that you see that? Okay. okay. So then, thank you very much for your attention. And we see each other next week, not here in the lecture, but on the excursion. And then we continue with the regular lecture in two weeks. Thank you very much.